SSCA Easier and Safer Cruising Summit. Tricks, tips, techniques, and solutions to problems. All of us have them. Special ways we have found to make our SSCA cruising life easier and safer. Don't be surprised to hear what seems like contradictory opinions. We purposefully have individual conversations with each speaker or couple so they do not hear what others are saying. They are not arguing with or biased by someone else's opinion. In cruising, as in life, there is no one solution for everyone. So we hope listeners realize these are personal opinions based on individual experience and they will form their own judgment for their own situation. Well, here we are at episode 9, and I'm sure you've been waiting anxiously to hear the conclusion of our safety and security discussions. Last episode, we discussed 1. Avoiding bad areas, 2. Firearms, and 3. Non-issue stories. So this episode we continue. Discover great and easy defense strategy ideas to keep the intruders at bay. Here, real incidents that happened to some of our members and how they escaped harm. Investigate what resources are available to keep you and yours safe aboard? This episode, we also have two short subjects. One, the importance of learning the basics before you go out cruising. And two, choosing the right cruising boat for you. And our buddy Bill Cullen is back with some quick tricks for our propane systems. Sound great? Let's get started. So we see that probably 99% of the times our fears are unfounded about pirates or robbery. Most encounters end up to be harmless people just trying to sell some fish or to beg some food. So the thing is you don't want to hurt harmless people, but you want to defend your boat also and sometimes you don't know that they're harmless until the last moment. So what are some non-lethal defense strategies that cruisers can use to defend themselves and their property. Somebody comes on board and is armed with, you know, whatever, a knife or another firearm. Uh, you know what they want, you know. They, 90%, 99% of the time, they don't want the boat and they don't want, uh, they just want some money. Um, so, what I do, I... Um, I have a little hiding spot, not too very hidden, but hidden, where I keep, uh, you know, $100, $120. And then I have a, a really, really impossible to find hiding spot where I keep whatever else I want to keep. So then uh, my plan, which of course never happened, my, my plan would be to offer, you know, my wallet and say that's all I've got, you know, maybe $20, $30 in it. Um, then. If there is some threats and some, you know, insistence, then disclose uh, the, the second hidden spot, and that will be the end of it. At the end of the day, I think you just keep smiling and hoping that uh, you know they take that little bit money that, that you offer and they, they go away. They, you don't feel you don't threaten them, and uh, yeah, just. I don't say you have to sympathize with them, but, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. We've been out uh, this is now 13 years, on 14 years, and another four years around the Caribbean. And we have only had one incident of theft or somebody on board that was not invited. 
and that was two years ago down off of Bougainville, which is kind of a known area that's a little dicey. And the guy was drunk. We had met him during the day, and he showed up at night um, in our cockpit with a shirt wrapped around his head and a machete in his hand, knocking on the door, telling us to open up. (laughs) Of course we're not going to open up for something like that. So after a couple of minutes talking to him, we said, okay, if you don't leave, you're not going to like what we're going to do next. And he didn't leave. So we turned on our very loud alarm siren combination with a big light going around like on a police uh, boat. And uh, he left pretty quick. But that's the only incident in, what's that, 17 years we've had a, had a problem. But uh, we do have some measures that we take for our own security. And I'll go through those in a minute. Again, on our website, uh, I did a long article for multi hull Sailor Magazine and an SSCA article on uh, defense in depth. And what that refers to is you don't, don't always have to be offensive in nature uh, when a security issue happens on your boat. Uh, there are multiple defensive options that you can take to uh, get not a defuse situation or get whoever is on board to leave. Here's a couple of defensive ideas that you might use, and a lot of these are included in the things that we've written about. One is the alarm, like we mentioned a little earlier. Uh, In our cockpit, very, very loud, uh, 120 dBs, I think, or more, and a big uh, uh, light going round and round. And the idea there is if anything happens on the boat, and we're at an anchor with other boats, we click that thing on, and anybody in Anchorage is going to be able to hear that, and the light will show them where the problem is, and we'll have the VHF on so we can talk about it. Other options include sprays, air spray, pepper spray, even um, wasp spray. Wasp spray is not really good. I've read about this a bit uh, since we decided that uh, that was an option. And... For most people, they can, they'll they come right through a wasp spray if they're intent on uh, doing harm, on harm or stealing something. But bear spray, for sure, if you can get it, is a, is a real deterrent. Yeah, it shoots out about 15 feet with a spray, and you probably saw some of that if you were watching the uh, Capitol riot. Uh, people had bear spray. Another good option is a taser. Uh, there are many of these sold online. Uh, in combination with a little flashlight. And so if you had a flashlight that had a fair amount of uh, uh, luminosity to it, luminosity to it you, and you had the taser attached to it, you could shine the light in someone's face and then hit them with the taser. The problem with the taser is it's a temporary thing, and you have to be able to hold it onto their skin for five seconds or so before you're going to get them to fall down. And then you have to have some way to constrain them. So you would need handcuffs or some other method to uh, keep them in one spot. Um, while you're underway, trailing polypropylene floating line, about a quarter inch or five sixteenth inch in diameter behind you, uh, is a good way to keep people from coming up behind you with an outboard motor because that line will get caught in their outboard and spin up the prop to the point where it stops and then they'll be stuck. And if you're careful with how you tie the line onto your boat, uh, as soon as the, the outboard boat stops, then it'll break the line. Um, we have a system for installing electric lifeline on the boat. I haven't gotten to do it from that yet, but there's a boat here in the harbor that uh, has done that, and I've seen one other uh, cruiser that did do that and said it was very effective. Another way that uh, we've recently come up with are lasers. Uh, a good, strong laser will blind someone for up to about 10 minutes at several hundred yards. So this would be a good way to prevent someone from boarding your boat. Just get that laser into the driver's face, and they'll have to stop for uh, a number of minutes while you, hopefully you can get away. Another thing you can use is your flare gun. But, of course, you want to be careful with this. Those things, when they start to burn, they don't go out quickly. And you would never want to use that inside and maybe not even to some, have someone that's on your boat. Because when it lands on your boat, after it's uh, hit the person, it's going to burn a hole. 
Uh, on the last boat, we had the ability to make, and I did make, hatch bars over all of our hatches. So these were made out of one-inch stainless tubing, and uh, they were uh, very firmly attached to the edge of the uh, of the hatches so that nobody could get in. There was a hatch bar going one way and then a hatch bar going the other way. And we had one of these that could be removed quickly if we had a problem. But that's an absolutely secure way of not having to lock your hatches down if you're in a hot area. You can leave the hatch up, the hatch bars to prevent anybody from getting in. Of course, we always lock up the boat at night when we're any place we are. Uh, it's advanced. Anyway, it's always locked, and the, on this boat, the only attachments we have are the little ones that are over the bunk that nobody can get into. Staying away from dangerous areas, areas that we've researched have, that are uh, high security risk. And another reason to have an HF radio so that you can find out from other cruisers that are there ahead of you whether there's an issue or not. And this changes pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis in some places. Uh, I know when we were going around the Caribbean, uh, some places would be bad and, and others wouldn't, and then that would change. Places like uh, Guatemala, Rio Dulce, was always dangerous. We couldn't stay outside the marinas. When we first uh, went down into the Caribbean, we stopped at a little place that had never had a theft, uh, a theft. And sure enough, that night, three dinghies were stolen. And that's what prompted me to install uh, dinghy davit that would get the boat up six or eight feet above the water. And uh, that's another thing, that probably the highest risk thing to be stolen on a boat is the dinghy and its motor. Particularly if you have a 15 horsepower motor, that is the motor that most thieves, uh, particularly boatmen in these third world countries want, is 15 horsepower. And so if you've got that, you need to make sure that you take uh, good care of it, lock it up every night, get it up out of the water. Uh, I think one of the more important aspects to all of this, besides all these little things that you can do, and again, there's lots of ideas, and uh, that goes back to defense in depth. The more of these little things that you have that you can defend yourself with, then when a situation occurs where you need something, you can go to more than one item. So, for instance, the situation we had down off Bougainville, uh, we could have used our flare, we could have used lasers, we could have use a bunch of different things, but the easy thing to do was just turn on the alarm, and that defused the situation. So more of these things that you can have, uh, the better. One of the strategies is always to close your boat when you are um, away and uh, put everything inside from the deck with could tempt somebody. I had my tender stolen in Sicily, mm -hmm. actually at the in front of the marina, and that was uh, pretty embarrassing. Um, I also had my fishing gear stolen because I was unattended for about an hour in, um, in an evening in Indonesia. Security is always a, a big uh, issue, of course. And, you know, when we cruised, there were fewer problems than there are today, I would say. What we did for sleeping at night was we put in two of our three uh, washboards in our companionway hatch, and we closed the hatch so that it was latched but air could still circulate through the boat and go out, but it was not a big enough space that anybody could climb in. And then the hatch that was directly over our berth, I just put a two inch by two inch uh, teak bar across the middle of it, which made it so that if somebody was trying to drop through the hatch into our berth, they wouldn't be able to do that. But if there were ever a fire on board or anything and, I need, and we needed to get out through that hatch, I could just break it with my fist. That seemed to work for us. I also bought a great Theo Shack with this little, very inexpensive movement alarm, and I kept it underneath our dodger. It's much stuff on deck, but we, whatever we had on deck, we had chains or, or cables through it. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people paint their outboard ugly colors so it won't get stolen. Uh, I think that my attitude on the outboard, we always had some significant locks on the the dinghy and the uh, ashore, and if they want it bad enough, they're going to get it. My sort of attitude was, I'm going to just have enough stuff on mine so that they look at somebody else's dinghy and think that's a better target. So that was our approach to thievery. We lost a dinghy once when we were in a boatyard for months, but 
in terms of people coming out to the anchorage uh, and stealing stuff off the deck, we never, ever had a problem. What about pirates? And uh, what about thieves? Well, we had a little black dog who just barked like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he pretty much kept, I think we never had any trouble with anything being stolen, and I think the dog played a big part in that. That uh, he is a very, was, Skipper was a very good watchdog, and he would bark viciously if anybody came close to our boat. And um, so we never had any problems. The only time we ever locked ourselves in our boat at night was when we came back around and stopped in Margarita, Venezuela, and uh, things were pretty rough at that time. So the, we did lock ourselves in at night there, you know, shut the companionway door and put a padlock on it. Um, but we never had any, nobody came on our boat. Nobody boarded it, so we didn't have any problems. But that was the only time we were worried enough to do that. We were also extremely cautious about inviting any locals on board our boat. I know some of our friends would invite them on board at a drop of a hat, but we only very selectively let anybody on the boat so they couldn't, you know, scope it out or anything. I think that's so why. That. Yeah, that that's wise. In some in some places where the people don't have much, and some well-meaning cruisers say, "Oh, you know, we want to invite them on our boat and serve them this and show them that," and Sometimes uh, you might be doing uh, yourself not a favor because they will see, oh wow, these people are rich and these people have this and these people have that and they don't have and they don't have much of anything at all. So it's best not to tempt the devil, as you say, until you get to know them. A good way to protect yourself from thieves is to install a regular house alarm system. And you connect your alarm system with magnetic switches on your doors or even infrared and connect it to a big deck lights and a big siren. So that can deter anyone coming in. But as far as alarm goes and avoiding any surprise effects, our choice is having dogs on board because they are not only great company for your cruising life, but also they do a great guard dogs and watchdogs. If you get in an area that you don't feel too comfortable, you just get your dog to bark a lot there when you first arrive, and anyone in that area or shore, they may have some ideas to come and visit you during the night, probably will give up because they know that you have an alarm system, they will be watchful. I think one thing you have to try to do is diffuse any situation. You know, if, uh, if people are ready to break the law and before they actually broke the law, they realize that the chances of getting away are not very big, they may just decide to do nothing and that's perfect for you. One way to protect yourself from pirate at sea that we use when we were sailing in the southern Philippine is we created an mp3 recording of a conversation between me on the US on the SSB radio and some Filipino official on the other end of the VHF or SSB radio and so we had that uh, mp3 recording on our sound system so if we had uh, any boat approaching us and we were worried that they may be pirates, I would just kind of play that sound on the speakers inside the boat and in the cockpit. And that means that for that boat approaching us being near, they will hear like a very frantic conversation between some other crew member, because they have no way to know it's me <laughs> that they can see outside, and, and some official, and that means they will realize immediately that uh, there is no surprise effect and that one of the crew members on board is already in touch with some local enforcement agency. They might be, you know, coming very, very soon. And so I think it may be, uh, so it can be a deterrent for them to uh, even show any bad attention at that point. So here's the actual MP3 recording that we did in the Philippines 
where you will hear the local authorities talking to us on the radio and us calling them for help. So listen to what we have to say. Maybe you'll get some ideas of your own and uh, hopefully uh, it will help you to avoid a bad situation. Now one thing of course after you've made such a recording don't go around advertising all over the radio to other cruisers that you have this recording otherwise it may backfire on you hey, come and come and help us please come and help us please I think they are like some people approaching I think they are quite suspect can you come and help us please officer Cape, the mobile patrol is on the way we will be on that particular area for a few minutes I have already directed the terminator to bring a high power fire to for possible apprehension of suspect. Okay, okay. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Hey, come and come and help us, please. Come and help. Did you take away some ideas about defense mechanisms, or flush out an idea that you already had but were hazy about the details? If you come up with a novel idea of your own defense strategy, share it on an SSCA sharing site or leave a comment on this video. But sometimes, despite all our best efforts, robbery, piracy, and even hostage taking does happen. Let's listen to these members and what their in incidents were and what the outcomes were. Just in Curaçao, in one of the anchorages, uh, another boat was robbed and the couple on it was beaten, And but uh, to us uh, nothing happened. We had um, off of Nicaragua, we had a large cigarette boat we were about 50 miles offshore, and it approached us from we don't know where with three young gentlemen in it. And mm. Ron did tell me to go below. That was unusual um, because it was so far off the coast, and it was a big power boat that mm. used a lot of fuel. Mm. And they did approach him, and they just told him he had a pretty boat, and they wanted to know where he was going, and... Um, I just stayed below. That was the only time I'd actually felt like I was hiding, but I was. You just were making conversation and then they zoomed off? Yeah, we assumed they were uh, maybe a drug running boat or something. Yeah, they just talked for about five minutes and then they said, adios, and they <laughs> took off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guess they decided you you weren't the, the kind of boat that they wanted to steal or hurt. <laughs> All right. Well, I, we were around Venezuela. There was an incident where some a, a really nice looking couple came up with them in a speedboat and said, Oh, we're going to have a beach barbecue and we forgot to bring our matches. So do you have any kind of lighter or... So when this older couple went down below to get matches, they were surprised by the young couple right behind them with a knife on on their back. They terrorized the couple, slashed them up a little bit, tied them up, ransacked the boat, and then left. So what I would advise in this time in 2021, where Venezuela is quite desperate with shortages, people starving, uh, they would be desperate to do anything. So I would advise don't even go there. Well, when we first started cruising, there had actually been some piracy uh, episodes in the Caribbean. And actually, a cousin of Dee's who had been cruising in the 80s had a terrible story about being attacked. And they wrote a, she wrote a book about it. And there was piracy. And it was really because of the drug running in the, Car in the Caribbean. They would basically take over a boat and throw the owners overboard and use it to run a load of drugs to the U.S., and then they dump the boat. And so it was a little bit of a reality in the late 80s and early 90s. 
I think by the time we were out there, there wasn't much of that left, but a little bit. But the problem was, again, because there was no internet, there was no really good source of reliable information. Every piracy report in the Caribbean got blown out of proportion because it got reported 30 different ways and different times, and they got the name of the boat wrong, so when somebody else told it, it was a different boat. Right. So what, what was one experience ended up sounding like 30 different episodes. And so some friends of ours, uh, John and Melody Pampa, uh, I can't remember the name of their boat right now, they started the Caribbean Safety and Security Network okay. uh, in about 96 or 97, and I, I'm pretty certain it's still going now. And uh, they started getting a reliable database of, of what was happening. And for most of the time we cruised in the Caribbean, there was very little piracy, in fact. I mean, there'd be one or two, one case every year or two. We did feel really vulnerable when we were leaving Oman to go to uh, Yemen, to get to uh, Aden in Yemen, because that's really the worst. It was the worst area. That's where the Captain Phillips thing uh, movie was, and, and that's where they were taking lots and lots of boats when we were there. And we went with four other boats, and we maintained radio silence. And I wrote an SSCA article on all the anti-piracy strategies that we developed. And it was really scary, and boats came by us, and we'd see them on the radar. And, you know, it's like they went by us, and if they didn't pull out AK-47s, I guess they weren't pirates. But there was nothing we could have done if they chose to go after us. We had four boats together. We sailed really close, much more closer than you'd ever want to normally sail. Right. We had no lights on at night, and we were a quarter mile apart from each other. And nobody bothered us, but, you know, I don't know if it was the luck of the draw or what we, we – I mean, we did all the – we didn't have – we maintained radio silence. We gave fake radio reports as to where we were. We had no lights on and all that. Um, so, you know – I mean, I can't advise people to put themselves at risk. We did it. We were okay, but it was a scary time. We left Aden a day before some of our friends, and there's a little anchor. You, to go up the mouth of the Red Sea is very narrow, and you need to do it with the tide uh, in the uh, area called the Gate of Tears, the Bab el Mandeb, the entrance to the Red Sea. So there's an anchorage just a couple hours away from that, so we anchored there to leave at like four in the morning, and there were all these fishermen around us. We didn't have any problems. The next day, we told our friends about this anchorage that uh, they could stay there and before they went on up the Red Sea, and so they stayed there, and the fishing boats that had been all around us came over and approached them and said, are you guys okay? Do you need anything? And my friend said, well, we're a little afraid of the pirates, and the guy said to him, we're the, we're the pirates, and we're not going to bother you. Don't worry. Oh. So take that for what it's worth. I have no idea whether the guy was facetious or real or what. The, the worst thing uh, was uh, privacy, um, and that's what we all are a bit worried about. In the south of Sri Lanka, we were approached by two fishing boats in two separate occasions, it was clear they did not have uh, good intentions, but uh, we had a good win, and I put the engine on maximum, and they could not pass six um, knots, and I was up on nine and a half, ten knots, so uh, they, they, we lost them, thank God. But in 2012, sailing from Grenada down to Trinidad, I don't know whether you know, a year or two years before, there was a German single-hander. He was approached by these Venezuelan fishing boats, mm. and they killed him, threw him overboard, ransacked his boat, and just left the boat drifting. Oh. He was found on the beach later on. And uh, when I came down, in, and by the way, last year in April, the um, Trinidad rigger was with his boat and his son, and he got approached by the, these guys. Um, and this is generally boats who uh, brings drugs up to the Caribbean or wherever, and then on the way back down again, uh, they will normally sit around the gas rigs, uh, the oil rigs, because there are a lot of lights and waiting for boats there. Um, and um, uh, Jonas, the Swedish guy, uh, they boarded his boat and they didn't kill him and his little son, but they ransacked the boat. Um, I've seen the boat in Trinidad since then. When I came in 2012, 
I was sailing during the night and early morning, and there was not much to do. I was alone. So I was listening on Channel 16, and there was a Canadian warship, 711, and they were patrolling uh, and stopping all these boats in the area going back and forth, etc. And uh, it was just entertaining to listen to them talking whatever language they were doing, Spanish or Portuguese or whatever, and um, stopping boats and checking them out. Then I was very early morning, there came one and the later on a second one, a boat with about eight guys in it. And they approached me with high speed and then slowed down. And um, so I called up the Canadian warship 711. I told them what was happening and I told them, I think these are pirates. Uh, they're observing me and they're just following me in a distance of a hundred meters, a bit more. And uh, they called the, the captain on the bridge and he said uh, that they would uh, stand by for me with a helicopter. Then they switched on their AIS. I gave them all my details and they told me to keep talking, keep talking, describe the boat, uh, etc. Take photos, which I did, but I could not send it on to them or I didn't have internet etc. And um, then the second boat came and there was a lot of talk in Spanish. And uh, they obviously had heard that I was on the phone with the, the warship, etc. So they stayed for probably another half an hour or mm. something. I got a little bit more wind and uh, I could then uh, increase the speed, etc. And then they seemed to slow down. And uh, the warship stayed six miles behind me uh, for several hours until I was 10 miles north of Trinidad, and then they said goodbye, and I thanked them for, for being there. I think if they had not been there, I would probably not be here today. Uh, Jesse James and the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard has set up a system now whereby you go to Jesse James' website, and then you can download a few forms, um, and you should fill it in, and you should send it to them, uh, both to Jesse James and the Coast Guard, and there's something, the radio, I can't remember the name. You send it to them. You tell them when you're going to leave. You tell them the, if you're going to keep to their waypoints or not. They want you to go in between the two oil rigs, and which I was a bit worried about. But we did that, and we didn't see any uh, boats at all, nothing at all. We saw the oil rigs, of course, on a distance, probably five miles on, on each side of us. But they follow. And then there is a meeting point. They try to get um, a group of sailors together. There was nobody when, when I set it out. There were two who wanted to do it, but the average speed was five knots. I can't slow down the boat to, to that. It's, it's too complicated. So I, I did it alone. Uh, but uh, it's a good system he has set up, and Jesse is very keen on it. And the Coast Guard are the ones who make the waypoints. So I used them. They're okay. We were unfortunate to be in Samal Island uh, in the Philippines, in the marina, during the time that four hostage were taken. And in that case, we had uh, AK-47 pointed right at our face when we were in the cockpit of the boat with a bunch of uh, guys uh, telling us to go out but we had our two dogs barking ferociously and everything looking really mean and I can tell you those uh, uh, Abu Sayyaf guy didn't come on the boat they just gave up for easier prey or what so again that definitely a case having live dogs even though they are small but they can look pretty mean was a perfect deterrent and probably a save or butt in that situation Wow we heard some very interesting stories about what happened to some of our cruisers, especially Paul Dunnerup. And thank goodness the warship was out there patrolling around and he just happened to have heard it that evening before and f knew that he could call them. So sometimes maybe it's only our guardian angel in the sky that watches over us cruisers and keeps us safe but we are very glad that in these instances nothing harmful happened to ourselves or to other people in these stories 
Now we move on to our short subjects of this episode. Melinda Shell is going to remind us the importance of learning the basics of sailings before you go out into the cruising world. So everything that you do becomes instinctual. I have seen people who are very novice. They don't have a clue what they're doing. They really don't understand sailing. And they're out there trying to sail a boat. And that's okay in, in uh, confined conditions or in really stable conditions. But if you're out there and you really don't know what you're doing and bad weather hits or a big storm comes up or the winds get really high, you have to be able to know what you're doing. And, and it has to be instinctive. It's got to be, okay, you, can't, you don't have time to think, I guess is what I'm saying. And um, we, we sailed for years before we ever got on the, on the Tayana. We sailed small boats and we raced. And racing is the best way to learn how to sail, let me tell you, because you really got to know tacking and moving sails and, and operate in a, a matter of seconds as far as the helm, et cetera. So we raced um, for 12 years on a small, on the 26 McGregor. Um, and so we knew sailing. Um, when we got on this big boat, I was overwhelmed with the lines and the, and the sails. Like, oh my, my gosh, we didn't have all this stuff. Our little McGregor, we had a battery. <laughs> we had no systems, no systems. We carried water on board, and we had one single battery. And it had a um, uh, a yeah, outboard motor, and um, that was it. So sailing, we knew, but getting on a big a big forty two foot with with all with a diesel engine and all this inside stuff and systems, electrical systems and uh, plumbing systems and. Uh, big sails with with lots of lines. It's overwhelming. You, you, we, our learning curve went straight up the first year, but we knew how to sail, and that was our saving grace because we knew that if we got into a bad situation, we would know instinctively how to handle the helm, how to handle the sails. And I think that um, that's one of the things that people need to learn to do. We've had people say, "Oh, yeah, I've never." I, I don't know what I'm doing with these sales and this kind of thing. And you're thinking, oh, good luck, honey. <laughs> you get out there. So that's just my advice. Uh, people think they can just learn as they go. Um, and you do learn as you go. I mean, there's no question about that. But the, you, like you said, you really have to have the basics down. And you got you to gotta know how to handle when the wind switches all of a sudden, when you get big puffs of wind. You've got to know how to trim those sails um, to keep the boat from going over or, or, or getting yourself into real trouble. Um, you know, we, <laughs> we went from a tiller to a wheel, and that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> spent 12 years operating a tiller, and all of a sudden I had a wheel. It was like driving a car, <laughs> and that was, that was um, a real experience. But um, anyhow, those are the kind of things that, that you really need to know ahead of time. I also like the idea that you started out with a 22-foot boat, and I think I think a lot of women would be less overwhelmed and um, afraid if if they started out on a little boat, <laughs> something that they you just think of as like your toy or your weekend thing, and and learn how to sail that, and then the, you you just apply the basic principles of building up as you go up in size. And I, I think it would be less scary for a lot of women um, if you if you start out with a small boat and you can handle those sails, you know, just whip the sail up there and uh, by yourself and it's not a gigantic anchor and, and all those things that are overwhelming. So I, I also like the fact that you started out with a small boat too. We, we also started out with a little nine we had a catamaran. It was like nine meters, and uh, it was so fun because, like I say, you could just handle everything yourself. We didn't even have a windlass. We just sort of pulled the rope up and pulled the anchor on board, and and so it was a wonderful way to learn. So our next short subjects 
has to do with choosing the right boat for you is of course an ever so important choice because investing in a boat is a big decision. Choosing a boat is a very personal matter. It depends what you really want to do. In our case, um, it was long, long distance cruising and for long distance cruising, the first thing uh, you want is a solid boat which can take some bashing. Th such a boat would uh, be very different to what is being sold as charter boats today. It has to be solid. Uh, we think uh, of a monohull uh, of a length of about 12 meters, perhaps a few centimeters less because of uh, fees. Of course, at sea, a boat is always too small unless when you have to handle sails in awkward situations. And when you are in a yard, the boat is always too big because of all the work which has to be done. So uh, I think around 12 meters is still uh, a decent size. I would choose a boat with a medium length keel. Not just a fin, but a medium length uh, keel with a skeg which supports the rudder. I would not like to have windows on the hull because you never know when somebody will, will try to help you putting a fender just in the wrong place and your window is perhaps pressed in. And maybe the waves can also do some damage. I would like to have just small windows on the superstructure of the cabin because windows can break. I just take an example, a large yacht um, parallel to us when uh, sailing from uh, ABC Islands along the coast to Cartagena in Colombia. Mm. Uh, we had some very severe catabatic winds supported by trade winds and um, it was highly uncomfortable and two of the skylights of that large yacht were smashed in. So things do break. I would not like to have a cockpit incorporated uh, with the cabin, nor a doghouse incorporated in cabin, just for the same reason. When a wave breaks, a wave or anything uh, breaks uh, one of the windows, you would have the water directly into the cabin, which is not um, uh, highly pleasant. Well, and one also would like, I prefer our protected cockpits, when we were down in um, New Zealand, in Taranga, uh, Super Maramu came in, brand new, and it had his front window of the cockpit window smashed in. If um, the cockpit would have been incorporated with the cabin, the water would have been in the cabin. Further, I would like to have a stern which allows a strong wind lane steering to be installed and the cockpit layout should be such and I'm thinking of Biminis perhaps and things like that the cockpit layout should be uh, in such a way that the wind is uh, not being interfered too much before coming to the vein of um, the wind vein. And I also would say, keep it simple, to reduce the maintenance and repairs. Okay, that's a, a, a very good description of things to think about when you are choosing a boat that some people may not consider. Well, let me explain what Capri is first. Capri is 40 feet. And... and uh, we found out after we started sailing that when we get to the various anchorages, she's one of the smaller ones around. Uh, if the boats are smaller than 40 feet, they're usually single anchors. Um, the size today seems like everybody's, it started at about 45 feet and go up. Um, I guess had it been up to me, I would have probably looked around for something about 43 or 45 feet. Uh, but when he wanted something that she felt uh, very comfortable uh, sailing by herself. And, and that would mean a, a 40 footer. Uh, they get bigger than that and and everything just gets bigger. And, and you know, they, 
as a boat gets bigger, if you get if you get a spanking by the weather or, or something, then the spanking gets bigger too. It's, you know, it, uh, you get more comfort, but you also can run into a lot of other problems. So Capri is a is a Chinook, and she's what's known as a Sunfast, which most people don't know what it is, but most people do know the Sun Odysseys. And uh, the Sunfast is a Sun Odyssey that has been uh, made over to become a performance cruiser. Mm. So she's a very fast boat, uh, but she has all the uh, comfort uh, inside of the Sun Odyssey because that hasn't changed. It's the same hull, uh, same uh, build up inside. The one of the things that we've we've talked about, she only has one head, and and uh, you know, would we would we change that? Would we like to have two heads? Well. You know, if you've been on, on one tack for three or four days, and that happens to be the tack where the toilet uh, salt water intake is above uh, the water, and you're having to flush with fresh water, then, you know, sometimes you could think about maybe it'd be nice to have two toilets. Um, it's a good size for us. Uh, it does not, 40 feet doesn't lend itself to having... Uh, guests too much because uh, while we do have an aft cabin, uh, half our aft cabin is, as most long-term cruisers, filled with uh, spare parts and tools and, oh, well, God knows what else. Uh, all those things you carry along when you're carrying your house on your back. Um, we feel it's important uh, that whatever boat you're going to, to sail off in, uh, that you're capable of handling it. If you're going to do what we do, which is double handing, you have to be able to handle it by yourself. Which means even in, in, in a nasty squall, you have to be able to handle uh, trimming the sails. You have to be able to handle reefing uh, the sails by yourself. Uh, if, if you can't do that, then double handing is always going to be an issue because you're always going to have to wake the other person um, ours is a double uh, wheel helm, which is nice. It, it means you have a big open cockpit, uh, which we feel is good. It's especially nice uh, for when you're at anchor. Uh, one of the things we found out, we hadn't realized that before we left, is that, you know, in reality, we probably only spend about 15% of our time sailing, really sailing. The rest of the time, we're at anchor somewhere. Or if we're sailing, we're just sailing between some islands. And while you should absolutely make sure that the boat you buy and choose is a, is a seaworthy and well-founded boat capable of making a circumnavigation or making uh, long passages, you really have to turn a sharp eye to how comfortable is this boat going to be when we live on it at anchor, we have to remind ourselves this is our, our, this is our house. Uh, if you spend your time in the coconut milk run, uh, you, our advice would certainly be make sure you get a, as big a cockpit and as roomy a cockpit as you can because that's where you're going to spend your time. Uh, and if if you if you really want big ones, buy a catamaran. What can I say? Uh, but but we, we're we lucky. We have a big cockpit, and when we have our bimini over, it gives us plenty of room to be in it and lounge around. Um, we've been on boats with smaller cockpits, and I would say that that would get pretty cramped. Um, now, of course, if you're going to go exploring off the coconut milk run, uh, meaning you're going to sail into high latitudes, then you also need to have a good salon. You need to make sure you have a heater. Uh, if you can, if, if you can get a, an enclosed doghouse, would be nice, uh, or at least a, a hard uh, dodger uh, if you're going off the beaten path uh, because you'll need it. It'll get cold. But in a coconut milk run, you don't have to worry about all that. Some people, especially Americans, seem to feel that they want to have air conditioning um, our advice to that would be absolutely not. 
Um, if you if you put air conditioning in, you'll never get used to the heat, which means that when you come up out of the salon, you'll get pulled over by the heat. Uh, usually, wherever you are, there'll be a, a uh, some some trade winds blowing, and if you open up warm at night, then uh, your your salon will cool down. Uh, you got a good bimini, you've got shade, um, and you'll get used to the, the heat. Air conditioning is just, it's not necessary. And, and it, it, it's actually probably a bad idea. Uh, some people like a catch. We have a sloop. Never sailed a catch, so I don't know how great the advantage is. Um, Winnie and I have talked many times that about maybe we should have chosen the catamaran instead. Um, I don't know. We, we, we have seen one or two catamarans that we really liked. Uh, they 40 footers that were just perfect for, for us. Uh, on the other hand, we like our, our Caprice. <laughs> um, I, it's very individual. Uh, but I guess the best advice we can give is make sure it's a well found boat that can take the passage making and make sure you've got the room and, uh, for that 80, 85 percent of the time you're going to spend at anchor. I think your perspective about each person being able to handle it and being comfortable handling it um, is something not too many people think about. So it's good to have that point of view. Now we move on to my favorite part of the episodes. Our great buddy Bill Cullen is back to give us some great tricks and tips to help us in our cruising life. This time he's going to tell us a few tricks about <laughs> propane systems. Well, one of the things that I always perplex me on my boat is how much propane was left in the tank. You know, you've been out for three weeks and you kind of pick it up and shake it and you're just not sure whether you got a week's left or two weeks left, that kind of thing. So uh, the solution to that is a propane gauge, which is really a luggage scale. And you can buy one of these on Amazon or Walmart, even either a digital or analog. But what you do is, uh, in the picture, you see a 10-pound propane tank. And it weighs about 10 pounds empty and weighs 20 pounds full. So when you weigh it with the luggage scale, and it says you have 13.3 pounds of weight, you know that you have a third of a tank left, and if you've been out three weeks and, and you have that much left, you know you're good for at least another week. So it's a way to measure pretty much exactly what's left in your propane tank. Some of us also use the little green bottles for our gas grill, uh, and I don't know if you know it, but you can refill those with that little valve that you see here. and. Uh, what you're supposed to do, do is put the propane tank in the refrigerator and chill it down, the, the little green ones. And then you uh, simply connect this valve between your big propane tank, and then you turn the whole thing upside down, wait four or five minutes, and the propane fills the little green bottles, and you can reuse them instead of having to buy them. And if you're looking for where to find green bottles, go to a campground on Sunday. There's usually a bin full of them there. By the way, to reuse your green propane one-pound bottles. The little adapter thing that you go between tanks, you have that made or can you buy that sort of thing? Oh no, you can buy it and there's a link on my website and I think more places are carrying it now than used to, but you can find them fairly easily either online, Amazon, or West Marine, that sort of thing. Okay, hey, that's a great idea. Like all of us people on yachts, we hate to just use something once and then throw it away. And we think of these little tanks as uh, something that you just use once and then you, you dispose of it. How can we safely fill this little tank? And uh, can you ally the fears that people have about refilling propane? Oh, yeah. Um, this, uh, some of the tanks say don't refill these tanks, the little green ones. Uh, I think they probably put that on there because they want you to sell more tanks. But yes. <laughs> uh, people, have been doing, people have been doing this for uh, a long time. I've been doing it for uh, over a decade. 
and never had any problems. If you do uh, occasionally have uh, the little green bottles valve will go bad on you and then you have to throw that one away but uh, usually you can smell the propane obviously you don't store these things down inside your boat either right and i would assume that when you do your filling you're doing it outdoors and fresh air etc right and uh, as long as the valve is good on the little green bottle you won't have any problems with this Right, and as long as you're not smoking your cigarette while you're in the process. <laughs> okay, thanks for that great idea, Bill. You know, we want to have spare parts for whatever we think is going to break, which uh, those of you that have been out there a long time, it, it, the list is quite long. One of the things I had fail on me one time was the propane solenoid. And when it fails, it, it's in the closed position, so you can't get any gas to your stove. You can't carry everything, and uh, having one of these solenoids is something that uh, I don't carry on my boat. But I found a solution so you don't have to carry one of these, either to purchase at a local hardware store if one's nearby, or I carry this now on my boat. And it's simply a replacement for the electric solenoid. And as you see in the picture, it's a flared both ends fitting. So it would essentially replace the solenoid. And I keep this down in my spare parts department. And if my solenoid does ever fail on me again, I can simply insert this between the two sections of pipe and replace the solenoid until I can have someone bring one to me or I can find one somewhere. And uh, it's fairly inexpensive. I think this part costs about $2 to buy. You do then, of course, have to operate your propane tank by hand. But, you know, it's a good meantime sort of solution uh, until you can get the pro proper uh, part brought in. So in effect it's a way to like bypass your solenoid. Yes. Okay yeah that's a great idea and a, a good thing to have on hand to get you out of some trouble and still keep you operating. And that concludes our episode 9. So take care and we'll see you next time. So remember, fly your birdies and swallowtails and invite others to join SSCA to benefit from sharing knowledge, ideas, personal friendships, and getting access to all the great stuff we present in the easier and safer cruising summit. Talk to you next time. We hope you enjoyed listening to our guests and took away some new ideas for yourselves. If you have something to say about any subject you heard, it's not too late to join in. Be sure to check out the preview of our next episode. Comment and subscribe on SSCA YouTube channel. Share this video on your social media. And join the camaraderie by participating in our coming new episodes. If you are not a member yet, visit SSCA.org to get in on the conversation and gain full access to the SSCA Easier and Safer Cruising Summit.